as we mentioned in the fundamentals course, calibration uh, itself and calibrating your model can be kind of a frustrating experience because you have to iterate through and go through and change uh, C factors and demands. And if you're doing this manually, it does take some time. And then you kind of get to a point where you're having to expend a lot of effort to change a lot of different variables, setting up new scenarios and new alternatives each time, and rerunning. And that can be a bit time consuming. But we can use the optimization of the uh, Darwin genetic algorithms to help us kind of steer calibration to good solutions much more quickly than it would take for us to do it manually. So our tool in this case is Darwin Calibrator. And I'm going to spend the next few slides kind of explaining to you what calibration does, or what the automatic calibration does anyway. Automatic ca calibration has been uh, the subject of a lot of papers and a lot of uh, theses. And it's probably the second most researched problem in water distribution engineering after optimal design, this automated design that we're going to talk about in a little bit. With optimal calibration, uh, what you do is you adjust uh, things like friction factors, roughness, demands. And you're trying to match the observed flows and heads, you're trying to get them to converge on something. But sometimes you can't be sure that you adjusted the right variable or the right uh, made the right decision to adjust the right variable because there's many good solutions that just differ so slightly that it's hard to really see the differences sometimes. For example, the correct solution for three pipes, maybe there's a C factor of 80, 90, and 100 and just three pipes alone and maybe the correct solution uh, is 90, 90, 90 but uh, maybe virtually in terms of head differences it could be 100, uh, 80, and 90 for these three pipes. Or is it um, 80, 90, 100 uh, for those various pipes? And there's different combinations. So uh, it becomes virtually difficult to see which solution is the best because there's such a such small difference. Uh, many approaches have been used uh, to do this, but genetic algorithms tend to work the best because they uh, converge fairly quickly. And they can deal with a mix of continuous and discrete variables and will tell you not just the best solution, but the second best solution, the third best solution, the fourth best solution in a ranking. And with Darwin Calibrator, you can use this genetic algorithm in the calibrator. Now, you can still do this manually to try to set the parameters and see uh, what's going to change the fitness the most, like C factors or demands. Uh, and that's called sensitivity when you uh, adjust things manually. Kind of you're doing it, you could do it in bulk and change all C factors by 80% just to see if that really moves the numbers in the models. It actually gets you where you want to go. And that, that's very helpful uh, because it'll let you know, well, you really probably should be changing demands because that's what's really changing the head drop across the model, not C factors. Or maybe the demands aren't high enough in your system to actually see the differences in C factors changes. Okay, so introduce Darwin Calibrator here. And what, what it actually does is it uses a genetic algorithm to change roughness, demands, and valve states across the system. And uh, there could be, you know, a 500 valves, 1,000 valves, there could be a couple thousand pipes with different C factors. You could have a couple thousand man nodes. You know, changing all of these manually, that's thousands of different variables to change, not to mention the millions of different combinations. In the next few slides, you're going to see how Darwin Calibrator uses a genetic algorithm to very quickly kind of make short work of all of these millions and millions of different combinations. And effectively, what it's going to do is it's going to be uh, testing for fitness, the which random solution converged out of, say, a set of six, which one converged most accurately to the solution or the data that you gave it. And then it takes successive populations and creates new solutions of or, or new iterations of the one that came out the best in that set. And it creates a new set of, say, child solutions looks at those child solutions and says, OK, this one's matching the best, and we're going to uh, use a combination that's same, same, or similar to, to uh, the next one. The way the genetic algorithm works is first it randomly generates a set of trial solutions. 
and for the first generation. Then it runs the model to determine uh, the heads and the flows and everything in the system. And it calculates the fitness for each of the trials. So in doing so, it's looking at what it's calculating to be the value versus what the actual variable was for pressure or flow that was calculated somewhere. So we can't really do this without comparing field data to the model data. So that's how it's looking at that difference in coming up with fitness. So then what it does is it throws out the least fit solutions and keeps the one solution that's the best as the start of the next generation. And at the next generation, it makes up new trial solutions based on crossover and mutation. Same, same, but different uh, with some variation thrown in there, but it's using the best fitness solution for the previous set to create children of the next. And this process, process continues until some stopping point criteria has been met, where fitness is at some level, or you, we've run so many different uh, variations, or so, so many different numbers of generations. And the general crux here is it's whichever one is the most fit and survives, uh, the most fittest that survives. And that's where that play, come, play on words comes in with Darwin. How that indicator is reached of when it's a good uh, solution. In the background, what it's doing is it's looking at the sum of the squares of the differences between the head observed minus the head that's predicting the model. It takes that, it squares it to where it's a positive value, and then sums up those values. So if you had a solution that had a lot of difference across a lot of different nodes, the fitness value would be high. Conversely, if you had a model solution where the observed value, difference between observed value and the model is small across the board, the sum of all of those nodes, then your fitness is going to be low. So that's kind of letting us know that the lower the value, the better the solution. Here are the three formulas used to calculate the fitness in Darwin. They all involve a difference between observed and model values. Observed being field data, model being predicted value based on water gems. In the first two, uh, the values are summed up over calibration nodes, while in the third, calibration is driven by the worst node. The minimum squares, the, the minimum difference in squares is the default formula that we use and should work in most cases. That's what we use in the workshops. So let's take a typical problem in which you're trying to find the solution of the roughness for four pipes. Choose four pipes. We're going to make it real simple. And you're pretty sure the C factors are somewhere between 60 and 100. So if we break the continuous set of possible solutions for pipes somewhere between 60 and 100, so if we break the continuous set of possible solutions into five discrete values, 60, 70, 80, and 90. And let, me, let me go ahead and make this a little bit more graphic for us. I'll draw it. So we have one pipe, two pipes, three pipes. Maybe that's how the network is laid out, and four pipes. So here's our four pipes. And any of these four pipes could either be 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100. That means we need to swap out the C factors. This one, first one pipe here could be 60. This one could be 70. This one could be 80. This one could be 60. So that's one round, one version of the combinations. But then we have to keep going through and trying different ones. Uh, so this means that we need to check ultimately 624 different solutions just to be sure we have the right answer and test all of those. Now if we extrapolate this problem for something like 10 pipes, there would be a really large quantity of solutions to have to test and verify. And then it gets really hard to get a good sampling of that because it's such a large number. especially if all you have to start from are observations 
have the HDL levels, uh, system head, at just a few numbers of points. How do you pick the right combination of C's is kind of uh, what you're looking at here, and it's just going to take you a long time manually. This is where Darwin uh, Calibrator comes in. And I think the answer for tin pipes is something like a couple million different solutions that it could have been. So here's the typical problem again for four pipes with five possible solutions. So again, four pipes. So each comma here represents uh, a pipe. And each C factor is a potential solution for C factor for one of those four pipes. So the model is run. And each, each model, the difference, the sum of the squares of the differences of the difference between the head observed and the head of the model predicted. So, right, so a fitness value is calculated. Runs a genet genetic algorithm, formulates a new set of solutions based on the one that has the lowest fitness value. So, in, the, in this case, 2.9 is the lowest fitness value. This is where it's then going to run a new solution based on those fitness values. And then we can look at the screen and say, OK, of the uh, six different solutions that are created, it looks like we might have one here that's got an even lower fitness value. And that combination seems to be working of 80, 80, 90, and 70, whereas before it was 70, 80, 80, 90, just that solution is working better with the lowest sum of the squares of the differences between head observed and head predicted. And then let's say this keeps going and going and going and running more and more computations. So after numerous generations, the fitness values are become lower and lower and uh, approach the best solution. So in this problem, we see a best solution emerge after some generations where no improvement can really be made. And then we have an optimal solution that we can use moving forward. In this case, point 0.1, that's where it kind of um, leveled off at. And we really couldn't see a difference anymore. And it's this is the way that fitness usually improves during a real world problem. At first, it converges very quickly. But after a while, after it starts running the multiple versions and then subsequent versions of the parent, it gets to a point where there's little, little or no real improvement reached between one solution or the other. So in theory, we should be able to drive the fitness to zero. But there are some limitations, like the number of time. Or remember, we were actually setting that's based on discrete values like 60, 70, 80, 90. But really, maybe the proper solution is 82.35 for one pipe. And that wouldn't be found since we're using discrete values. But it's actually, uh, we're, we're kind of forcing discrete values on the calibration here. In addition, I guess a more, more important one here is our measurements of head and flow have some inherent error in them in the first place, meaning they're not exactly accurate. The pressure gauges that we're using, the flow meters that we're using, even the elevations that we're using in the model. We're not down to uh, complete precision. There is some tolerance there. So we're not going to get exactly to, to uh, zero in a real situation, simply because there's data variation. And that is what would kind of make it more difficult for us manually to start start mowing through all of these various combinations, millions and millions of combinations, because it's hard to see the differences here. Before we, before we start up the genetic algorithm optimization, there's some numbers and options that you can set. And I wanted to just kind of share these with you. In general, you don't have to mess with the defaults that are there. So there's going to be some defaults that are uh, set up. So don't worry, you're not having to deal with these the terms splice probability and cut probability and all of these things. You're not really going to have to deal with that. The options you may want to adjust are going to be the maximum trials and the non-improvement generations. So, so uh, these are the main ones that you're really going to focus on. 
the default number of trials is 50,000. You may want to set it to 2,000 to play around with the model more quickly. But again, we're only talking seconds here. It's not like we're talking hours or minutes. And ultimately, you'd like to see the program stop when it finds a solution. The way it identifies this is the fitness does not get any better. It just doesn't nudge because it's toying between the, you know, the last few sets of solutions and just nothing happens, nothing changes. Uh, the default value set for the non-improvement generations is 100. Lowering this value will make Darwin run faster. Raising it will increase your confidence that there might be a better solution, but it will also re potentially reach a point where a solution cannot be found because it's tried so many different times uh, and it's not able to find a difference. These are pretty much just the two variables I would suggest you change. Nothing else. Don't have to worry about anything else there. Another thing that could really help with Darwin Calibrator is grouping of your pipes. The number of possible solutions that a calibration problem faces is pretty large. If you have 100 pipes with, say, 10 different possible C values, you're going to have 10 raised to 100 of possible solutions. And that's far too many to enumerate. Darwin Calibre can still handle those. But large numbers of pipes will make, make the calibrator run a little more slowly. So the way to speed things up is for you as a modeler to recognize that pipes do belong in groups together. They're the same cohort group, same installation date, same pipe material, and that you believe they'll roughly have the same C factor. So by uh, with the cohort group, that means that the pipes that are the same age and same material, same uh, small unlined cast iron pipe blade between 1920 and 1940 or something, that they're the same. So you can do similar things for nodes too. Combine nodes and groups of similar, say, residential area. The homes don't change too much in this area, so they're similar. In that case, then, so you've got 100 pipes in this example, but what, really what you have is five groups, which means that now you only have 10 raised to the fifth power of possible solutions. And that's a lot more manageable, calculates more quickly, and also boosts your confidence in other variables that you want Darwin Calibrator to change. And you can do this, you can do this grouping by graphically picking things using uh, filters and flex tables to group elements together into sets. And I'm, I'm going to add add something in here too that when you're graphically setting these elements in a group, you got to make sure that you don't put one element in another group too, or put one pipe in the wrong group because that could drive uh, you're you're telling or or assuming for Darwin Calibrator that these groups are correct. And if you incorrectly group pipes, then it's going to be changing the wrong pipes and the wrong nodes inaccurately. Human error can come into play here when you're setting up groups, so just make sure and be careful that you're setting up pipes and nodes in the correct group. I'm just going to go through a little example of how, how this is actually operating here. We're going to pick a representative scenario. We'll pick the element that has the value, the pressure, or the head. In Darwin Calibrator, we'll set any, specifically in Darwin Calibrator, we'll set any particular adjustments that we need as a scenario. But even with Darwin, Darwin Calibrator, as confident as it's going to make you uh, come out with solutions, you're still not guaranteed to have perfect calibration. The most common shortcoming of this is bad data, bad calibration data, or bad uh, field data. And you need to be really careful what data goes into Darwin Calibrator, because Darwin, it's like a savant, is very good at what it does, but it doesn't know to tell you whether or not you've got bad data coming in. It assumes that all the data you give it is good quality. So if you aren't sure of the effect or, or if it's questionable data, you can choose to run Darwin with and without certain data sets. And this can actually be pretty nice for you to be able to uh, do. Another another pitfall is lumping data into the wrong pipes or uh, nodes into the wrong group. 
Uh, another pitfall in running Darwin Calibrator is you start adjusting the wrong parameter. Uh, maybe you say you want it to correct the C factors when your demands are really off or something. How you would prevent that last one, you could have potentially done some sensitivity analysis and gone through and tried to see what's, what really is the model most sensitive to. Is it demands or is it C factor? Because you can tell a Darwin Calibrator change demands and C at the same time. Um, at that point, it's it's going to actually go in and do that. But do you want it to? Are you more or less confident of one set versus the other? In the end, use your common sense. It does a C factor, if Darwin Calibrator says so, does a C factor of 30 for a PVC pipe that was put in, in the last 40 years, does that really, really make sense? Probably not. So you might be an example of uh, changing the wrong parameter where demands may have been the thing that, that was off. walk you through an illustration of the problem in the type of data that you give it. Let's, uh, let's suppose that you have a single pipe system and these are the characteristics, 10,000 foot of pipe, 12 inches in diameter. Theoretically, if you know the downstream pressure, we'll be able to calculate the C value. Let's say, let's say the answer is 117. Now, at low flow rate, the velocity in the head are small. So if we measure the downstream pressures, we can't say anything about the value of C because virtually any C factor you use is going to get you the same pressure of around 85 psi. Remember the correct solution in this case is 117. But if you crank up the velocity by opening a hydrant or two, multiple hydrants, uh, now we get to see the case here at the, uh, here at the bottom where even if there are errors in the reading and the pressure, you'll always come up with a C factor close to the correct value because we see the difference in that C value. At high flow, you can say that the C is between 114 and 119. At low flow, you could say the C factor is anywhere between like 9 and infinity because you just don't see the difference in those changes. You can only use the data uh, like the lower table, the, the one on the bottom here, um, if you use low head uh, loss data. Then the error in the measurement will help you determine the actual C factor in Darwin. So the moral of the story here is you want to be able to calibrate a model based on data during high flows. If that's high flows during normal demand periods at a peak in the diurnal curve, or it's artificially simulated by opening up hydrants. In either case, if you don't take data during these high periods, you're going to be like me, where I was calibrating one of my first models. I looked around at the model. I looked at. I was out in the field actually doing this. I had my elevations in the tank and pump status. I had the field operators radioing in and telling me what the pressure was because we were kind of doing this on the fly. And wow, my model was operating so well. Pressure was within a couple uh, decimal places of PSI. By the way, fine print. Don't ever trust decimal places on, on pressure readings. I thought the model was great. And then I realized the error of my ways eventually that we were running the data at a low period, low demand period in the model. And of course, my pressure readings were going to be accurate because they were all pretty much relative to just whatever was in the tank. I then later realized and learned and educated myself along the way that I needed to run the model calibration at high flows so that I could see the real actual differences in C factors to see if there's a difference in the demand because I was just running at artificially low periods. We then ended up going in and turning on valves, uh, opening up hydrants, and really getting some flow moving. And then I could see bigger differences in departure between whatever I thought the model should say and what it was actually saying with pressure gauge data somewhere. So the moral there is turn up, crank up the flow. When you're using field data to adjust the model parameter, say using head value to adjust the C factor, the head must be sensitive to the changes in C factor. Uh, the equa this equation is, is just a uh, definition of the derivative where you, you can't adjust C factor in, in, say, the south side of town with a head reading in the north side of town. 
because if the velocity is too low, then the head isn't sensitive enough for the C in a different part of the model. What this is kind of kind of indicating for us is we need to sample our data in the same area where we're increasing flow to where the model can actually help simulate the difference between the head, the original head, versus the corrected head. This slide is just a nice reference slide to come back to uh, to start mapping out where your potential water water goes because there's always going to be the amount that you measure in a flow meter that's the amount consumed some of it may be billed some of it may not be billed basically customer information system data that's going to come out and have all of the flow meter data that of water sold that's going to be revenue water right but you may not have the unbilled uh, meter data which it's still metered but it's not billed it's maybe the city park or sometimes those aren't even metered at all. And then those would be showing up as a water loss because maybe not accurately metered or maybe it's guesstimated or something. Then you've got other things like water losses where there's unauthorized tap. Contractor hooks onto a hydrant and opens it up, opens it up and takes water off the line and wasn't allowed to do it. Or somebody, maybe somebody taps a line and there's a service connection that shouldn't be there that's not metered. Another source could be you have overflow at a storage tank. I saw that in one case where couldn't figure out where water was being lost in the system and lo and behold there was a elevated storage tank that was or a ground storage tank that was leaking a lot of water uh, with the overflow. So you can have lots of other places in your model where there's not just leaks in the seam of a pipe or something or a crack of a pipe. If you don't have high confidence in your demand and you said model just go change C factors, it could be changing the wrong parameters when in fact your, the demands you're modeling may not have accounted for these water losses here or unbilled meter data. That's actually a loss too because it's not something that's showing up as your lateral connections, uh, that little home symbol. You know, maybe you had all of the demands come in from those, but not not all these other variables. To include all these other variables, you would need to start putting in demands somewhere to simulate these losses. Uh, Darwin Calibrator will help you find leaks, but again, when you do this, you need to actually have some confidence in C factors at that point. Uh, have some confidence in your demands, because otherwise it's going to be hard for Darwin Calibrator to decipher where leaks actually are occurring. How it does this is it actually would start turning on uh, an emitter coefficient for nodes and start flipping them on like a switch and turn them up and turn them down and add more demands that could potentially be leaving the system to where uh, it turns it on enough to where, okay, this demand leaving the system here, this additional demand, the model's converging better. The difference between observed and predicted is actually smaller, and therefore it draws the conclusion, okay, there must be a leak here or at these multiple nodes. What I do want to kind of leave on, in your mind about Darwin Calibrator is that it's not going to tell you the exact, exact location on this pipe at this place. It's going to give you an idea of the area, the neighborhood, the junctions that it's relative to. And it's still going to require uh, maybe some field effort to go find uh, where that leak is actually occurring. And this guy, the gentleman's listening uh, through sound to see wherever the hissing is and try and narrow in potentially where the water leak is or occurring. And just like Darwin Calibrator, Darwin running the leakage, you still need good data, good confidence in the metered demand data. Another thing that you can do with Darwin Calibrator is not only have it adjust C factor and demands, but also valve states. So this allows you to find potentially closed valves that are actually in the model, not closed, but in the real world, closed. And it detects the difference in the pressure and goes and again kind of systematically starts closing valves, closing pipes, uh, opening pipes, and seeing if there's a difference in there as well in the model to where it converges more quickly directly on. And you know, all of these closed valves, they don't just jump up and say, you know, here I am, here I am. Darwin Calibrator is going to, it'll pick up the slight differences in pressure drops, changing head, but it really helps to see potentially closed valves if you're running more calibration uh, tests. The more you run calibration tests across the system, the more likely Darn Calibrator might be to see 
these particular uh, valve closures. If you just run only a few, it's going to be less less simple to detect these. So in this case, uh, looking at the differences between two pipes and whether or not uh, a valve would be closed here. So we've got, looks like 80 gallons a minute coming in one pipe, splits between these two pipes, and over here at this node, we're measuring 80 gallons a minute. In this case, uh, one pipe could potentially be closed. So I'll draw an X here. This is closed by valve, so we've got 80 gallons a minute going through this pipe. 59 PSI, so it looks like the difference is here, 59.7 versus 59. So it's it's kind of hard to see hydraulically that there's actually a closed valve here and until we start actually running higher flow through. Now we start running higher flow through these two pipes, 400 gallons a minute, 400 gallons a minute. Uh, so now we've got 80 PSI coming out the end. Now let's close the pipe again. And now we're starting to see a much bigger difference because we're trying to run a lot of flow through one pipe and it's just not, hydraulically, it's not going to be able to be met. And it actually would come up with a calculation of minus 9 PSI. Now, in the real world, it's not going to be, not, it's not going to be minus 9, but in water gyms, the calculation would show it would be, have to be like minus 9 PSI to get that to work out. So this is an example of crank up the flow through the line to be able to see the differences in head and C-factor and whether or not there could be potentially a closed valve or not. It's a low flow. You're just, it's going to be really hard to see. And generally, when you run calibrator, you're going to find a lot of closed valves. You're going to find pipes that were wrong, but it's going to take time. Uh, you'll find new connections that you didn't know existed, but that's, to me, the exciting part of calibration is you start experimenting and you start finding things that you didn't know, and your model becomes more accurate through this process. And genetic algorithms really make that happen a lot more quickly. When we open up Darwin Calibrator, we're going to see this. Uh, we, we open it up, and we're going to see uh, demand and roughness or status, so it's going to be changing these variables for us. Or we can have it just change one of the variables or two of the variables. This is just a kind of graphic showing potentially where a closed valve could be. In this case, the blue dots are the Darwin predicted values. The red stars are valves that were uh, found to be closed during the model. So the software would correctly identify uh, wherever the mains were shut down and just a pipe wasn't having any water flowing through it. All right. Th this is the overview of the automated calibration process. Uh, you must first start out with a model that runs properly. In, in this case, controls, you need to have good controls. You need to have uh, the tanks, proper tank size if you're running extended period simulation. You need to make sure there aren't any error messages or warnings that are, aren't then you need to go collect uh, field data, collect the customer information system data, screen the field data, make sure the field data is correct, identify whatever parameters you want to adjust, C factors, demand, valve states, group pipes together, group nodes together, set the ranges for the uh, C factors, set the ranges for demand, and then we'll create the objective function for the model, what parameters we want to adjust. The objective function is the, remember that's the least squares difference is one that there were the three different variables we pick from. Set any of the optimization controls that we needed to. Run Darwin Calibrator. And, and for really big models, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this. This will take some time for really big models because it's having to go through so many different computations. And then you run through, look at the results, and you can even run back through this by turning on some field data set. Maybe you have one field data set that worked really well, you were really confident, and maybe a few others use different pressure equipment. You could potentially turn off different sets of field data and then rerun it scroll through the results then at that point and you can look and see what were the changes that that made in Darwin Calibrator and what solutions were reasonable. 
and then you can finally apply the model. What does a good or the best calibrated model look like? Well, to answer that, it really kind of depends on how, first, how accurate it is that you need the model to be, and then how good your field data was to begin with, like how accurate or how much variation could be in there. Generally, you kind of stop when the cost of further calibration outweighs the potential benefit, or you've run out of budget. That's another point where you kind of stop calibrating is you don't have budget to do it anymore. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.